good evening um, am i audible uh, can i see messages on the chat please if i'm audible please give me a thumbs up thank you debraj good evening debraj yeah so uh, if you are here for the first time uh, this is dr shanmuga priya i am professor and head of the department of biochemistry at gonman thootukudi medical college and i am your an academy educator for biochemistry and uh, today's session is on image based M- image based mcqs hi good evening aditya so image based mcqs for inict and uh, in today's session i have uh, planned i plan to discuss few questions based on euchromatin heterochromatin all image based questions euchromatin heterochromatin i will tell you about how chromosome gets condensed and then we'll discuss about mitosis meiosis isochromosome crossing over and translocation yeah so this is the objective for today's session good evening malik and before i start the session let me tell you few facts about an academy plans plus subscription gives you an access to both live and recorded sessions it also gives you an access to a question bank with 25000 plus questions and most of these questions are clinical case based and they are framed based on the latest pattern and for every question there is also a detailed explanation iconic subscription gives you an access to both an academy and preplada platform Special class features include interactive live sessions. You will be able to participate in polls, and you can also use the raise a hand option. If you use the raise a hand option, you will be able to interact with the educator one on one, and you can get your doubts clarified real time. And these are our toppers in the latest NEET PG September twenty twenty one. The highest was six ninety four, closely followed by six eighty eight. And this is about all free tests that are being conducted in this month of November. So uh, uh, the biochemistry quiz happened yesterday, and this will be followed by on all Wednesdays we have scholarship tests quiz conducted by educators. So the coming week Wednesday there is a pathology scholarship test conducted by Dr. Preeti Sharma, and the next Wednesday it is SPM scholarship test conducted by Dr. Neha. And then on Fridays we have YouTube ritual test, and on Saturdays there is a marathon test, and on Sundays you have grand test usually. so i strongly suggest that you take up all these tests yeah because uh, it gives you a real time experience on how you would uh, what you would experience when you are given an mcq or how you would react to an mcq so to get that real time experience i suggest that you take up all these tests any of your comprehensive biochemistry courses for neat and next yeah i'm start i'm starting a comprehensive biochemistry course for neat uh, for fmg next everything so this month i'll be taking a comprehensive course for fmg next month for neat good evening mishra good evening all of you so that's about all these free tests and then this is about the focus fmg comprehensive batch and uh, the upcoming 13th november we have fmg free test as i told you and we have structured batches for all exams this is the target neat pg 2010 22 fast track revision batch which i was telling you about i'll be discussing mcqs uh, i'll be discussing comprehensively biochemistry in this batch and we also have a target next integrated system wise batch uh, which is starting on uh, 17th of november good evening dr s r d So that's all about an academy plans. Let's start discussing these MCQs one by one. Okay. So the first question is identify the structure B. So first, whenever it's an image-based question, do not jump to an answer. Yeah. Have a look at the picture. Try to understand every part of the picture and then try answering. Okay. So this is A. And what do you think is A? Do you think that it is? A, don't you see that it's a double-stranded DNA? So A is double-stranded DNA. and then you have structure b c d e and f and they're asking you about structure b what do you think is the answer do you think it's double stranded dna or nucleosome or 10 nanometer fibril debraj thinks it's choice d yeah he thinks it's choice d anyone else can anyone else make an attempt i'll first tell you the answer and then i'll explain you it is 
10 nanometer fibril. Yeah, picture B, image, uh, the structure B in this image is 10 nanometer fibril. Yes, answer is C. So, what does this mean? Uh, this depends upon your understanding of what is a chromosome. Yeah, what do you think is a chromosome? One chromosome is nothing but a long double-stranded DNA which has got condensed with the help of proteins. Do you understand this? If you asked what is a chromosome, your answer should be this is how you draw a chromosome, right? So what is this chromosome? This chromosome is nothing but a long double-stranded DNA which has got condensed with the help of proteins. Now, why do you have to condense chromosomes? Simple reason, if you just have a long naked double-stranded DNA, it is going to measure a few meters long. But your nucleus is only few microns in diameter. So you cannot just like that pack such a long chromosome inside a nucleus which is a few microns in diameter that is why you are going to condense it. And to condense it we use proteins which is the predominant protein that is used for condensing uh, chromosome. It is histones. So what is so special about histones? Histones are basic proteins. When I say basic I mean to say they are positively charged. And how about the charges of double-stranded DNA? Double-stranded DNA has got multiple phosphate groups. So double-stranded DNA is negatively charged. So there is going to be an attraction or electrostatic attraction to be precise between a double-stranded DNA which is negatively charged and histone which is positively charged. So that a segment of double-stranded DNA gets bound around histone. So what is this? this? is a segment of double-stranded DNA which has got wound around histone. So this gives the first level of compactness to your chromosome. Do you understand this? Now how many types of histones do we have? Very good all of you. How many types of histones do we have? There are five types of histones. H1, 2A, 2B, 3 and 4. Yeah, there are five types of histones. H1, 2A, 2B, 3 and 4. And out of these five types, all except H1, yeah, all except H1, the remaining four form dimers. When four form dimers, can we call it as an octamer? Yes, right. So we call it as an octamer. So this histone octamer sits in the center, which is rich in positive charges. And that attracts a segment of double-stranded DNA. Let me use blue color for double-stranded DNA. So this histone octamer attracts a segment of double-stranded DNA which gets bound around it. So this string on bead, what is the string here? The string here is a double-stranded DNA. So this string on bead, what is the bead here? Histone octamer. So this string on bead appearance is called as a nucleosome. So several such nucleosomes exist. I want you to just imagine that you have taken a long thread. You have taken a long double-stranded DNA. On this long double-stranded DNA, you have placed histone octomers at various places and you have allowed the double-stranded DNA to get bound around histone octomers. So several such beads exist which will be surrounded by a segment of double-stranded DNA. So this fibril is called as 10 nanometer fibril because the width is just 10 nanometer. Do you understand this? So from double stranded DNA, from a naked double stranded DNA, the first level of compactness which you get is 10 nanometer fibril because the width is just 10 nanometer. So all these nucleosomes are linked by a linker fragment and H1 histone. Yeah, H1 histone is present only in the linker fragment. Now you take this 10 nanometer fibril and you allow this 10 nanometer fibril to get folded on itself. Yeah, you take this 10 nanometer fibril and you allow this 10 nanometer fibril to get folded on itself. Now the width increases. What is this called as? Because the width has increased, you call it as 30 nanometer fibril. So from a naked double stranded DNA you first form 10 nanometer fibril and what you get next is 30 nanometer fibril. Now you take this 30 nanometer fibril and you allow this 30 nanometer fibril to form loops on chromosome scaffold. So in your nucleus, let me use purple color for this chromosome scaffold. In your nucleus you have 46 chromosome scaffolds, one for every chromosome. 
and these chromosome scaffolds are nothing but tubular proteins they act as a core for you to form a chromosome okay so <clears throat> so you take one chromosome scaffold on, and on this chromosome scaffold you allow this 30 nanometer fiber to form loops so it forms loops on all 360 degrees and it spirals around it yeah and it spirals around it on several such condensation you get a highly condensed chromosome on several such condensation you get you get a highly condensed chromosome with a centromere a short arm and a long arm is that clear so whenever you draw a chromosome with a centromere a short arm and a long arm what you should visualize is you should visualize a central core protein what is a central core protein it is the chromosome scaffold and on this what have you allowed to get wound around the 30 nanometer fibers have got wound around okay that is a chromosome is it clear to everybody if it's clear can you give me a thumbs up yeah so this is the image which was shown as the question right so in this question what is image uh, what is the structure a the structure a is double stranded dna naked double stranded dna and this naked double stranded dna has got wound around histone octamer so this structure is called as nucleosome right the structure is called as a nucleosome and this fibril is called as 10 nanometer fibril so image b i mean uh, the structure b of this image is nothing but 10 nanometer fibril and I have taken this 10 nanometer fiber, you have allowed it to get folded on itself. Now the width has increased, that is called as 30 nanometer fibril. So part C of this image is 30 nanometer fibril. Sometimes they don't get organized this way. Yeah, even if they are not properly organized this way, they also form a part of your chromosome. So you take this long uh, 30 nanometer fibril with this organized structures in between and you allow them to get uh, wound around a chromosome scaffold and that is how you get a highly condensed chromosome. So image E, this is nothing but a chromosome and F is nothing but nucleus. Have you understood every part of this image? Yeah. So what is the answer? That is 10 nanometer fibril sarkar all these would i mean i will not say every part of your chromosome would be a b type of dna there are some parts of your chromosome which can take z confirmation so those parts of your chromosome which are rich in gc sequences sarkar asks can we say it is all b dna so uh, all chromosome is not b dna a part of your chromosome which is rich in gc sequences will take up z confirmation but b type of dna is the most common physiological form of dna okay so what is the answer here? The answer here is 10 nanometer fibril. So this is the next question. Based on the image provided, which of the following is not a heterochromatin? So they have marked few parts. They have told you this is A, this is B, this is C and this is D. And they are asking you which of this is not a heterochromatin? Many of you have answered it as B. Okay, one person has answered it as B. Nemaijit says it's B. How many of you go with B? Can anyone tell me? Others, please try answering. Srishti thinks it's C. Good, Srishti. Very good. So, Srishti is right. Answer is C. Yeah, C is not heterochromatin. Let me first tell you what is uh, or what are the types of chromatin. So there are two types of chromatin, one is euchromatin, the other one is heterochromatin. And as the name indicates, euchromatin is transcriptionally active region of a chromosome. Do you understand this? If you take a whole chromosome, not all parts of your chromosome will be transcriptionally active. Those parts of your chromosome which are transcriptionally active will be called as euchromatin. And when I say it is transcriptionally active, how will it be? Will it be condensed or uncondensed? In the last question, I showed you how chromosome is condensed, right? So when it is, when it is condensed, do you think it will be active or inactive? The more condensed a chromosome is, lesser will be the access to transcription factors and replication factors. Do you understand that logic? If your chromosome is highly condensed, it will not have any access to replication factors or transcription factors. So that chromosome will not undergo replication, will not undergo transcription, which means it is 
inactive do you understand this so when i say it is active then that part of the chromosome will undergo uncondensation so active part of the chromosome is always uncondensed when i say it is uncondensed will it stain more densely or less densely when it is uncondensed will it stain more densely or less densely it will stain less densely in contrast to this what is heterochromatin heterochromatin is transcriptionally inactive region of a chromosome when it is inactive to enable package to enable package it is going to be condensed when it is condensed it will stain more densely okay so uh, in g uh, gm sa staining have you seen gm sa staining of chromosomes g banding of chromosomes so whenever you see g banding of chromosomes it will be always shown as alternating dark and light bands so what do dark bands and light bands represent dark bands mean it is not active light bands means it is active do you understand this now this heterochromatin is of two types one is constitutive heterochromatin the other one is facultative heterochromatin so tell me what is constitutive constitutive means always so if a part of your chromosome is transcriptionally inactive always then that will be called as constitutive heterochromatin and in which part of your chromosome do you have constitutive heterochromatin something which is inactive always one is centromere the other one is telomeric end yeah one is centromere very good debraj you are right so one is centromere the other one is telomeric end so can you tell me why a centromere has to be transcriptionally inactive always it is because only along the centromere we know mitotic spindle gets attached don't we know that only along the centromere mitotic spindle gets attached and when mitotic spindle contracts along the centromere chromosomes break longitudinally and whenever breakage happens breakage will never be perfect there will be tendency for one chromosome to gain some of the sequences there will be tendency for the other one to lose some of the sequences so tell me what would have happened if nature had provided a centromeric regions with coding sequences or active sequences then following every mitosis when you get daughter cells those daughter cells would have undergone either deletion or duplication of active sequences which is detrimental that is why we have evolved we have evolved in such a way that because we know that is the region which is subjected to repeated breakage we have evolved our cells in such a way that a centromeric region has got transcriptionally inactive sequences which are inactive always and only because they are inactive always they are highly condensed and that is why you mark it as a dark dot yeah why do you always mark your centromere as a dark dot to denote that it is heterochromatin okay and the other one is along the telomeric ends why along the telomeric ends you have constitutive heterochromatin it is because don't you know that following every cell division there is telomeric end shortening yeah following every cell division there is telomeric end shortening had you attended my special class on genetics in replication i told you the reason behind this for no for want of time i won't be able to tell you but i want you to remember that following every replication following every cell division there is telomeric end shortening so tell me what would have happened if telomeric ends are provided with coding sequences following every cell division the daughter cells would have undergone deletion of gene sequences which is again detrimental right that is why along the telomeric ends we have constitutive heterochromatin now what is facultative heterochromatin as the name tells you here it is active sometimes and inactive at the other times yeah sometimes it's active sometimes it is inactive and what is the example for facultative heterochromatin it is bar body okay it is bar body so why do you call bar body as a facultative heterochromatin you know in females yeah you know in females though we have in all our somatic cells though we have two x chromosomes only one of the two x chromosomes is transcriptionally active the other x chromosome is transcriptionally inactive that is why it is highly condensed and that is why it stains more densely as a bar body and this bar body will be pushed towards one side of the nuclear membrane yeah 
and why do I call it as heterochromatin because it is inactive why do I call it as facultative heterochromatin when I compare two somatic cells it's not always the same X chromosome which is inactivated we know it is a random inactivation of X chromosome for example in a somatic cell if the paternal X chromosome is inactive in another somatic cell the paternal X chromosome will be active we know it is a random inactivation yeah also this is the case only in somatic cells in germ cells both the X chromosomes will be active yeah that is why which is the best example for facultative heterochromatin it is female X chromosome when it is condensed and it stains more densely as bar body so what is the carry home message here anything which is highly condensed is inactive anything which is uncondensed is active okay is it clear to everybody so based on the image provided which of the following is not a heterochromatin now do you understand the answer yeah d this is nothing but bar body what is it it's an example of which type of heterochromatin it's an example of facultative heterochromatin and then what is a a is nothing but telomeric ends b is nothing but centromere and telomeric ends and centromere they are constitutive heterochromatin so what is the answer the answer is c c is nothing but arms of a chromosome along the arms you will have both heterochromatin and euchromatin so which is not a heterochromatin it is choice c okay so uh, can you tell me how can you convert heterochromatin to euchromatin suppose there is a part which is highly condensed we know it is inactive and you want that part to become active how can you make that part active what is responsible for condensation all of you what is responsible for condensation condensation is because of histones histones positive charges so by any mechanism if you can cancel these positive charges of histones that part of the chromosome will undergo uncondensation and then it becomes active right and that is done by acetylation what do you mean by acetylation by any mechanism if you can attach the acetyl group that cancels the positive charges yeah that cancels the positive charges and that part of the chromosome will then undergo uncondensation then it becomes active so one of the mechanisms by which you can convert inactive region to active region of a chromosome is histone acetylation or you can add phosphate groups same mechanism not only acetyl groups even phosphate groups are negatively charged will cancel the positive charges right so phosphorylation or it can be done by any form of alkylation not only acetyl group even propionyl group yeah even propionyl group when it gets attached it is going to cancel the positive charges so what are the ways by which we convert inactive regions of chromosome to active regions of chromosome by histone acetylation histone phosphorylation or histone alkylation and the reverse happens whenever there is methylation yeah whenever there is methylation of cited in residues whenever there is methylation of cited in residues of cg islands of cg islands of a part of the chromosome that part of the chromosome will undergo silencing yeah that part of the chromosome will become heterochromatin so methylation of cited in residues is one of the mechanisms by which you convert euchromatin to heterochromatin and that part of the chromosome is silenced so this is associated with gene silencing okay so yes sterically inaccessible means i don't understand your question so that is about methylation of cited in residues which causes heterochromatin formation okay so this is the third question it's a very interesting question i am very fond of cell cycle yeah so try to look at the picture and try to find out or understand try to understand the various parts of the picture but what is the question which of the following is a true statement and there are four statements which are provided and all four statements are aimed at finding out if you know replication happens in which phase of the cell cycle yeah they are asking you replication happens in which phase of the cell cycle very good elimina andy uh, he or she says it's choice c 
So there are two facts you will have to answer here. You will have to know when does replication happen and you will have to know when replication happens, will it be condensed or uncondensed? Don't we know the latter part? Whenever replication happens, will it be condensed or uncondensed? For replication, there is only uncondensation first. Uncondensation will be followed by unwinding. Yeah, uncondensation will be followed by unwinding and then there is replication. So replication, whenever replication happens, we know for sure it is going to be an uncondensed chromosome. Okay. Now can we try to understand the picture? The picture is, this is the picture. And in this picture, they have shown you this is G0 phase. Tell me what is G0 phase, all of you? G0 phase is resting phase. Right. It is resting phase wherein neither replication nor transcription happens. And when your chromosome need not perform replication and transcription to enable package, not functional. So to enable package, how will the chromosome be? The chromosome will be condensed. What's the option D behind you? Okay, you're not able to see option D. Option D says replication happens in C phase. It says replication happens in C phase and in C phase chromosome is uncondensed. Is that okay, Sarkar? Okay, so let's discuss this. So in resting phase, because it does not perform any of its functions, chromosome is going to be condensed. And they've showed you that this is M phase. If this is M phase, it means it's mitotic phase. And in mitotic phase, for one cell to divide into two, there'll be a phase called as metaphase. And what do we do in metaphase? I told you in metaphase, mitotic spindle is formed and it gets attached to centromere, right? And then in anaphase, when the mitotic spindle contracts, centromere has to break longitudinally. So in M phase or mitotic phase, you want chromosomes to break and you want chromosomes to segregate. For chromosomal breakage and segregation to happen, what form of chromosome do you want? Yeah, only when it is condensed and only when it is attached at one discrete point, breakage and segregation will be easier. So please remember in mitotic phase, which form of chromosome do you have? In M phase or mitotic phase, you have again condensed form of chromosome. Okay. Now what is the sequence of phases of cell cycle? Sequence of phases of cell cycle is G0, G1, S. Yeah, it is G0, G1, S, G2, M phases. Yeah, it is G0, G1, S, G2, M phases. So they have told you that this is G0, which means following G0, this is nothing but G1. And B is nothing but S phase. And C is nothing but G2 phase. And then it is M phase. Do you understand this? So it's G0, G1, S, G2 and M phase. Now, what do you think about G1, S, G2? What do you think about G1, S, G2? It is interplaced. Yeah, it is interplaced between complete resting phase and active cell division phase. So what do you call this as? You call this as an interface. So tell me what constitutes interface? G1, S, G2 phases will be called as interface. Why is it called as interface? Because it is interplaced between complete resting phase and active cell division phase. Okay. And in interface, what do you know about S phase? S phase or synthetic phase is so called because in this phase you synthesize two double stranded DNAs from a single double stranded DNA. Why do you call it a synthetic phase? Because you synthesize two double stranded DNA from a single double stranded DNA. So replication, yeah, replication happens in S phase. Okay, and if replication has to happen in S phase, what is the form of chromosome you want? It has to be uncondensed. So you know in S phase it has to be uncondensed. Now give a logical name to G1 phase all of you. A question is the kinetochore part of centromere. No, it is not about the kinetochore part. I will tell you about the kinetochore part in the next MCQ. Okay. So what was I telling you? This is S phase and what is G1 phase? G1 phase is before S phase, right? So what will you call G1 phases? It is called as pre-synthetic phase. Yeah, it is called as pre-synthetic phase wherein you proofread and repair the chromosome. 
So before you duplicate the chromosome, yeah, before you duplicate the chromosome, no point in duplicating a defective DNA. So what you're supposed to do is you have to proofread and repair the chromosome. So that is what is happening in G1 phase. And for proofreading and repair, yeah, for proofreading and repair, what form of chromosome do you want? For all those proteins to go and proofread and repair, it has to be uncondensed. So in G1 phase also, you want your chromosomes to be uncondensed. Now what is G2 phase? G2 phase is after S phase. So what will you call G2 phase is post synthetic phase. Yeah, it is second gap or it is called as post synthetic phase or pre mitotic phase. And in this phase, you double check the daughter DNAs. Because after replication, because replication is not an error free process, after replication, before you divide the cell, you are going to proofread and repair the daughter DNAs. And that is what is happening in G2 phase. So in G2 phase, again, we do proofreading and repair. So for proofreading and repair, what form of chromosome do you want again? It is uncondensed form of chromosome. So what is the carry home message here? The carry home message here is G1, S, G2 phases. Yeah, G1, S, G2 phases collectively called as interface. There is continuously replication and proofreading happening for which you want your chromosomes to be uncondensed. So in interface, your chromosome is indistinct. That is how you can remember. In interface, your chromosome is indistinct in the sense, if a chromosome looks like this, I would say it's a distinct chromosome. Once it undergoes uncondensation, this is how it would look. So in interface, your chromosome is indistinct because it is uncondensed, because it is getting ready to undergo replication, it is getting ready to undergo proofreading and repair. Is it clear to all of you? Yeah, so in G0 phase, it is condensed. In M phase, it is condensed. In interface, it is uncondensed. Okay. So these are the facts that I have given us uh, typed form in the PDF which I shared in the telegram group. So I told you G0 or resting it is condensed, M phase or mitotic also it is condensed. In interface G1, S, G2 phases, in interface it is uncondensed. Okay. So now tell me the right answer. What is the right answer for this question? Does replication happen in B phase? Yes, this is S phase. Yes, replication happens in B phase. And the chromosome is highly condensed? No, in interphase it is uncondensed. Replication happens in S phase? No, this is post synthetic phase wherein replication does not happen. Proofreading and repair happens. So this is false. Replication happens in B? Yes. And the chromosome is uncondensed? Yes. Okay. So answer is choice C. So can you try looking at this picture and tell me about isochromosome. So first tell me what is isochromosome. Usually a chromosome has got a short arm and a long arm. Instead if you have two short arms of a chromosome or if you have two longs of, of a chromosome then that is called as isochromosome. So they are asking you isochromosome is a defect of which of the following stages. Is it B or C or E or F. So can we try understanding the picture first? Don't you see that as a result of this, Chinmayi, very good Chinmayi, she says it is E. Excellent. I'm happy. Yeah, so let's try to decipher this image. Uh, do you see that in this image, one diploid cell, yeah, this is a diploid cell. One diploid cell has given rise to two diploid cells. So what is this image about? This image is about mitosis. Yeah, same arms on both sides of centromere. You are right. So it's an image of mitosis. Okay. Now, uh, if this is an image of mitosis, what do you think about image A, the part A? Do you see that in part A, chromosomes are indistinct? You are not able to see the chromosome, right? Chromosomes are indistinct. If chromosomes are indistinct, what phase is it? I said it is interface. So in interface, chromosomes have undergone duplication, they have undergone uncondensation. 
and then they are getting into this so after interface it is m phase or mitosis okay so let's try to understand the various steps of mitosis as i told you in mitosis one diploid cell let me choose a color which is seen in black color so as a result of mitosis one diploid cell with one pair of chromosome yeah with one pair of chromosome uh, here red color let's assume that it represents maternal chromosome blue color represents paternal chromosome so as a result of mitosis one diploid cell gives rise to two diploid cells yeah this is about mitosis and this mitosis goes through how many phases first it goes through interface before mitosis what happens it is going to be an interface so what do we do in interface i told you in interface you allow chromosomes to uncondense so following uncondensation chromosomes will look like this long arms men two long segments fragments okay so now chromosomes have undergone uncondensation after uncondensation in interface i am drawing interface here in interface after uncondensation what happens is duplication of chromosome happens in s phase so following duplication yeah every chromosome will now have two long arms and two short arms yeah they have two long arms and two short arms so such a long uncondensed duplicated chromosome of interface is getting into mitosis and in mitosis the first phase is called as prophase and in prophase it can be prophase of mitosis it can be prophase of meiosis okay irrespective of that there are two events that happens in any prophase the first event is condensation of chromosomes don't we want that to happen i was repeatedly telling you only in interphase chromosomes are uncondensed whereas in mitosis chromosomes have to be condensed so what is the first thing that happens in prophase in prophase all chromosomes condense and there is pairing of homologous chromosomes what do you mean by homologous chromosomes paternal copy and maternal copy or called as homologous chromosomes so paternal copy of chromosome 1 gets paired with maternal copy of chromosome 1 that is what we mean by pairing of homologous chromosomes so tell me what are the two events that happen in any prophase yeah in any prophase there is condensation of chromosome and there is pairing of homologous chromosomes and the next phase is metaphase in metaphase you don't have nuclear membrane and in metaphase as you all know mitotic spindle is formed and it gets attached to centromere okay in metaphase mitotic spindle is formed and it gets attached to centromere and tell me what happens in anaphase in anaphase when the mitotic spindle contracts as i told you the centromere breaks longitudinally and one long arm and one short arm goes to one pole the other long arm and the other short arm goes to the other pole so what happens in anaphase in anaphase one long arm and one short arm has gone to one pole the other long arm and the other short arm has gone to the other pole okay this is what is happening in anaphase and what happens in telophase in telophase nuclear membrane reappears so this cell has now divided into two daughter cells okay it has divided into two daughter cells do you now understand mitosis yeah do you now understand mitosis so this is all you need to know about mitosis so tell me what is mitosis mitosis a process by which one diploid cell gives rise to two diploid cells mitosis happens in m phase of cell cycle and prior to m phase there is interphase in interphase there is uncondensation of chromosome and duplication of chromosome otherwise called as replication okay and after uncondensation duplication is over it gets into mitosis the first phase is prophase what happens in prophase condensation of chromosomes and pairing of homologous chromosomes yeah that is prophase metaphase is always for mitotic spindle formation so mitotic spindle is formed it gets attached to centromere in metaphase what happens in anaphase mitotic spindle contracts and the centromere breaks longitudinally one long arm and one short arm goes to one pole the other goes to the other pole and then in telophase nuclear membrane reappears this is how one diploid cell gives rise to two diploid cells 
Now isochromosome is a defect of anaphase wherein when the mitotic spindle contracts instead of the centromere breaking longitudinally it breaks transversely. So what will happen when the centromere breaks transversely? One pole will have two long arms, the other pole will have two short arms and this is called as isochromosome. So tell me isochromosome is a defect of which phase of mitosis? Yeah, yes, role of microtubules or a defect of centromere. So somebody was asking me about um, uh, one fact, kinetochore, right? Who was asking? Debrad Sarkar was asking me about uh, kinetochore. So what is kinetochore? Whenever mitotic spindle is formed and it gets attached to centromere, a complex is formed. Yeah, complex of mitotic spindle, centromere and associated proteins. That is called as kinetochore. So isochromosome is basically a defect of kinetochore that the centromere of breaking longitudinally breaks transversely. Okay, so isochromosome is a defect of, isochromosome is a defect of which of the following stages? A is interface, B is prophase, C is early metaphase. It is early metaphase. Do you see that mitotic spindle is formed? Even here mitotic spindle is formed. So this is late metaphase. And this is anaphase, E is anaphase and F is telophase. When do you see nuclear membrane is reappearing? Yeah, so this is telophase. So isochromosome is a defect of what? Anaphase, so it is choice E. Okay. So this is the last question for this session. Use the image, uh, which of the following chromosomes would fit into the category A. So they have given you four categories. It's a very simple question, right? So what are these four? These four are types of chromosome when you classify chromosomes depending upon the location of the centromere or depending upon the relative sizes of short arms and long arms. And what are the four types? The four types can be remembered as MSAT. So what does MSAT stand for? M stands for metacentric chromosome. S stands for submetacentric chromosome and then acrocentric chromosome, telocentric chromosome. So what are the four types of chromosome classified based on the location of the centromere? It is metacentric, submetacentric, acrocentric and telocentric chromosome. And we don't have any telocentric. What is a telocentric chromosome? Here the centromere is pushed far towards one side in the sense there is no short arm at all. Yeah, it is almost invisible. There is no short arm at all. So human chromosomes, we don't have any telocentric chromosomes. We have only metacentric, submetacentric and acrocentric. Okay. So when will you call it as metacentric chromosome? When the ratio between long arm and short arm is equal to 1, which means centromere true to its name is present in the center. Yeah, if it is present in the center, the short arm and long arm will be almost of the same size. But it is not precise uh, uh, mathematical diagram, right? It is science. So when the ratio between long arm and short arm is between 1 and 1.7, yeah, between 1 and 1.7. And if the chromosome looks like a letter X, wherein all the arms are of same length, then that is called as metacentric chromosome. And what are the examples of metacentric chromosome? Start from chromosome 1, 3, 16, 19, yeah, 16, 19, 20. So tell me what are the metacentric chromosomes? Chromosome 1, 3, 16, 19 and 20. All these are metacentric. Now what are submetacentric chromosomes? Here the ratio of long arm to short arm is between 1.7 to 3. Yeah, it is between 1.7 and 3. And uh, I will tell you the examples later. Okay, so this is about submetacentric chromosome. Here the chromosomes look like L. Yeah, one is a bit long, the other one is a short. Yeah, so L, it looks like a letter L. Now what is acrocentric chromosomes? Here it is pushed far towards one side. One arm is quite short, the other arm is quite long. And the short arm does not have any coding sequences. The short arm has got no coding sequences. Only then you will call it as acrocentric chromosomes. What are the examples of acrocentric chromosomes? 13, 14, 15, 21 and 22. Yeah, 13, 14, 15, 21 and 22. 
So these are acrocentric chromosomes. So how many chromosomes have you included so far? I said metacentric includes 1, 3, 16, 19, 20. Acrocentric includes 13, uh, 14, 15, 21 and 22. Totally 10 have come under this. So how many do we have remaining? Yeah. So the remaining will all be submetacentric chromosomes. Do you understand this? Out of 23, we have accounted for 10. So the remaining 13 will come under submetacentric chromosomes. Is it clear to everybody? Yeah. So what is the answer here? Using the image, which of the following chromosomes would fit into the category A? Category A is metacentric. Metacentric, it is 1, 3, 16, 19 and 20. So what is the answer? The answer is chromosome 16. Okay, it is chromosome 16. And what do you know about 13? 13 is acrocentric chromosome. 21 is also acrocentric chromosome. X is submetacentric chromosome. Okay. Good. Okay. What is your question? Telocentric is not seen in human chromosome microorganisms we don't have it okay so thank you all thanks for joining me uh, we'll see you tomorrow with another session uh, i think tomorrow will be a mixed bag mcqs uh, i'll be covering many mcqs based on metabolic pathways okay see you good night So uh, at 9 o'clock there is a special class wherein I will be continuing about euchromatin and heterochromatin because few students ask me about methylation of cytidine residues. What is the role of methylation of cytidine residues? So few of those questions and I will also be telling you about heteroplasmy, phenotypic heterogeneity, allelic heterogeneity and that session is at 9 o'clock now. Okay, see you.